Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for sticking around. Um, as Sarah already said, my name is Monica. I'm working in Berlin at a fintech company called SumUp. Um, and there I'm working as lead front-end engineer. And I've been there for the last four years, and I watched the company grow from about 80 people to more than 1,500 people. So today I'm going to share with you guys some of the things I've learned along the way when it comes to building resilient front-end applications. But before I go too deep into that, I want to start with a question for you all. And that is, why do we rewrite software? I don't know about you, but there are things where I feel like I have rewritten them so many times. There are features at my company, I have written them so many times that I said, I will quit if I have to do it again. You know, you just keep doing the same things over and over. And the question is, why is that? I think there are a whole lot of reasons. Um, in order to illustrate some of these, I want to tell you guys about my first ever experience rewriting somebody else's code. So I got my first tech job when I was 19 years old. My job title was student webmaster, which is a pretty awesome job title when you think about it because you get to be both the student and the master at the same time. And I think it's a lot cooler than senior developer or whatever it is, uh, the job title we give to 19-year-olds these days. Um, and yeah, so I came into this, to this job. I was a student webmaster. And my job was to write PHP and MySQL, because that's what I had been teaching myself. And I inherited an existing application. I got it from the previous student. But the interesting part was that that guy was writing object-oriented PHP. But I didn't know object-oriented PHP. I knew how to make some templates that made SQL queries inside of them. So I received this code, and I was like, OK, I have to do something with it. And you can probably imagine what I decided to do. I decided to rewrite it, of course, because I couldn't understand it. I didn't know how it worked. And I didn't have the, the ability to sit down and, and, and figure it out. And I think this is a big reason why a lot of code ends up getting rewritten. It comes down to inexperience. It takes a lot of time and effort to read somebody else's code. And oftentimes, it's more fun, more interesting just to rewrite it yourself. On top of that, we also often rewrite code just for the heck of it, right? I don't know about you, but every year around Christmas time, I'm definitely going to be giving myself a new layout on my statically generated blog, right? Uh, not necessarily because I got to do it, but because it's something to rewrite. I have some time. Um, and you know, sometimes this also happens at work, maybe. You rewrite something because you enjoy it, maybe not because it's really the best from the business perspective. We also often rewrite code because finally there's a better solution available. As you know, in the world of front end, oftentimes we have to hack our way around things that aren't really supported or native yet. And sometime later, we finally get to remove those hacks because finally there is support from the platform. But I think one of the biggest reasons why we end up rewriting code, at least when you ask a developer why is it necessary that this code has to be rewritten, there's a very good chance they're going to say this last reason. It's because that code is technical debt. Technical debt is one of my favorite terms because it applies to anything. You can look at any piece of code and just call it technical debt, and people will somehow believe it. Um, but the question is, what actually is technical debt? I think if I was to ask everybody in this room, what's your definition of technical debt, there's a very good chance I would get a different answer from each and every one of you. Is it code I didn't write? I think oftentimes this is a pretty good way of explaining code you didn't write. It's technical debt, and that's why I need to rewrite it again. Or is it code that I wrote before I knew what I was doing? I have a lot of this for sure, right? Because I've been in this job for the last four years, so I've had a, some time to see the impact of my learning <laughs> in the course of this project. Is it old libraries? Sometimes people want to upgrade things or they want to change them and they're going to say, well, this is, this is debt. Maybe, maybe it is. Or can you also see technical debt as things like features that nobody's using? Because you know in the front end we love to migrate things, right? And every time you make a migration, you need to pull along all of these features that maybe no one's using, but you've got to migrate them too. Maybe that's also slowing you down. So if I had to come up with one definition of what's technical debt for me, it would be code that negatively and repeatedly affects the speed or quality of delivery. This can be code, can be tools, can be infrastructure, anything like that. 
And we all know what technical debt looks like in real life. You start working on a project, things are super fast, right? You add a new feature, it's like the speed of a flight. But over time, this goes down dramatically, and it becomes very painful to add new things. But what I've also seen is something like this, right? You have a new application, you get to add new things to it, over time it becomes slow, and then you reach this point. You tell either your tech lead or your product owner, I can't do this anymore. Like, this is breaking me on the inside. And so you refactor, right? You get a sprint or two to finally refactor that code. But what often happens is that your productivity thereafter slides right back down. And why is that, right? Because you thought, finally, I know how to do this. But you refactor and you find out, oh, maybe that original implementation was actually handing, handling some use cases I didn't think about. And maybe that original design wasn't so bad. I like to think about this as technical debt on a subscription model. It's like, I can't figure out how to cancel my subscription. I get charged for this all the time, and there's nothing I can do to make it stop. Um, and you might be familiar with the official term for this, uh, which I find pretty depressing, the fact that there is an official canonical term. Um, this is called the second system effect. And this is the, the tendency of basically taking something that works and replacing it with something that is totally overcomplicated and over-engineered because you're pretty sure that now you know better than whoever designed that system in the, in the first place. There's another great quote by the inventor of C++. He says, legacy code often differs from its suggested alternative by actually working and scaling. I don't know about you, but when I reflect on these kind of, um, you know, essential truths about software development, I, I get sad, you know? I'm like, is this really the job I want? Like, if, if this is what I'm doomed to do, why should I rewrite anything, you know? Can't we just go back to using Delphi and just leave it all the way it was back then? Maybe it was fine. Um, it, it feels like there is this endless loop where you just need to rewrite and migrate things over and over again. And at some point, you just get tired of it. And that's, that's the hard fact of life when you are working in software development. That's the real cost is not in the initial development when you first add that feature, but it's about maintenance over time and what that really costs you in the long run. So the question is not really why do we rewrite software, but rather how can we make our systems more resilient to inevitable change? It's just like what Nick was talking about yesterday. If you have a software project that never changes, you know, that's amazing, but that's not reality, right? We have to make our systems adaptable because that's how the world works. So the question is, how can we go from something like this, where our speed or productivity dramatically decreases over time, to something like this, where we actually build in tools, infrastructure into our applications that allow us to kind of accelerate our productivity to a certain point? How do we reach the promised land? the nirvana, you know? How do we reach the application that all of us actually enjoy to work in? The answer is kind of unsatisfying, right? People will tell you it's good architecture. Well, if you had just architected this app properly, you wouldn't be in that situation. And you're like, thanks, I know that. You know, it's like literally the worst thing anyone can tell you. You're just like, what a good friend you are, like real talk. Um, and why is it? Why is it that we don't feel like this is a very satisfying answer? Well, I think a lot of it is because architecture has become kind of like a dirty word. You know, you, you hear it, it kind of sounds elite. Maybe you have or have never worked with a software architect before. What do they do, in fact? We know that software architects have kind of transcended coding, but what comes after coding? some diagrams and some meetings maybe, mm, but it's not really easy to say what, what, what that is. Um, there's also no clear definition of architecture, so in the software development community, everybody has a different idea, right? Uh, you can imagine if those of us working in front end can't even decide on flow versus TypeScript, how hard is it to get developers to agree on something across disciplines? Um, basically, nobody really knows what is truly software architecture. 
And at the end of the day, it feels really detached from our daily problems, because the kind of problems that I have when I'm working on an app is I need to make this button do something different than it does today, and that's really, really hard because of whatever things someone else did at some point for some reason. So when you say good architecture, eh, it doesn't really like tickle you the way that maybe that person thinks it's going to. So instead of trying to define architecture yet again and being like, okay, now you're gonna listen to me because I have the definition, I kind of want to reframe the discussion and instead look at architecture as enabling constraints. So what are some constraints that we can put on our applications, on our code, the way we use data, that are going to allow us to move faster and safer over time. Now, this might sound a little bit abstract, but let's start with a real world example. Imagine you are driving in a car. Now, I'm from the United States, but when I moved to Germany, I learned that there is you know, some roads there on the Autobahn that you can drive on at absolutely any speed. There is no speed limit. Um, and for me, this is kind of a horrifying concept because we definitely don't have this in America. Um, but somehow, people manage to drive on these roads at astronomical speeds without everything exploding into a blazing car crash all the time. Why exactly is that? Well, when you think about it, when you're driving down the highway at these ridiculous speeds, you have some constraints in place. You have solid barriers that protect cars driving fast in one direction from cars driving really fast in another direction. If you wanted to change lanes or interfere with somebody going the other way, it's going to be pretty difficult. At the same time, we have conventions like divisions between the roads. We have our turn signals, right? Ways that we communicate with each other about what we're about to do. So in this way, we're able to drive really fast to move quickly and yet do it in accordance with certain constraints that enable us to stay safe. And I think you can kind of apply this to programming paradigms that we all know. This has kind of evolved over time in terms of software development. We have found more and more ways to constrain ourselves rather than giving ourselves new abilities. Think about object-oriented programming. When object-oriented programming, let's say, was discovered or it was made possible to do on the computer, we kind of gave away certain, certain abilities that we had, right? We were no longer structuring our programs with go-to, right? This was, this was no longer a best practice, let's say. Um, but because of the fact that we shifted from having function pointers to having classes, we were able to decouple the architecture and an organization of our applications from the way that it was deployed. And this meant we could finally have independent deployment. Now, functional programming, on the other hand, is something maybe more of you are familiar with. One of the most common constraints in functional programming that people encounter when they move over there is immutability, right? Strictly speaking, mutable data is more powerful than immutable data because you can just do more with it. You have more options. But at the same time, constraining ourselves to use immutable data is something that gives us more power because we can write applications where we're not worried about different parts of the application operating on data that they think one part thinks it owns and the other one does as well, and then you end up with conflicts. So we don't need to put locks in place in our program saying, hey, I'm working with this data, like don't touch it. Uh, so that's a power that we get by saying, I'm not going to use mutable data anymore. Interestingly enough, I think you can also find this pattern in software development on the front end. Think just very simply about var versus const. These days we're using const instead of var, right? So no longer can you reassign the variable that you were working on, right? You can't just make it to something totally different. And this makes our programs more readable. When you have a function, you have some sense of predictability. This is not going to wildly change over the course of this function. Let's talk about jQuery to React. So strictly speaking, in some ways, you could say that jQuery gave us more abilities in the sense that it allowed you to operate on a very low level uh, inside of the DOM. But we kind of gave that away, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, you can still hack around these things, but you're encouraged not to use some of those capabilities, which by, J by jQuery standards were default. But we finally got a more predictable user interface and were able to do testing that we were really not able to do before. 
The last one I'm going to mention is a little controversial, um, right? But I'm, I'm towards the end, so everyone else has already made the CSS and JS stuff by now. Um, but what I find interesting, having worked with CSS and JS over the last year or so, is that it helps me not to do things I'm not supposed to do. Right? It helps me not to rely on these kind of global side effects. Strictly speaking, it's a constraint, but it actually enables us to write more predictable programs and have some more safety uh, in our applications and the way we define our styles. So the point I want to make here is that we are constraining ourselves all the time. We're not looking for new powers and new things to be able to do. We're instead looking for more best practices, right? We're looking for limits we can place on the way that we're building our applications. And those constraints are things that we trade for safety and speed, because we know that it's better to have those than it is to have every capability in the book. So for the second half of my talk, I want to share with you three specific constraints that you can use today. You can, well, not today, maybe, but Monday. Um, and you can apply them to the applications that you are working in um, and actually set yourself up for having an application architecture that is going to be more maintainable over time. And of course, I should mention this is not exhaustive, right? There are big books having been written on architecture. I can only touch on a little bit, um, but I hope you come away with something useful. So we're going to look at these three specific constraints and what we get enabled as a result. The first one of these comes down to source code dependencies. One thing I find really interesting is that a lot of times people wonder and talk about how should my directory be organized, right? What's my folder structure? Um, but at the same time, we're not really thinking oftentimes about how the actual interdependencies in our application work with one another. To some degree, the folder structure is helpful, but it's also aesthetic, right? It's, it's for humans more than it necessarily is for machines. So there are a couple of different ways you can potentially organize the interdependencies inside your app. I'm not talking about third-party dependencies. You can have what's called the big ball of mud. Now, if in the application you're working on today, you don't have any strict rules about what is allowed to depend on what in your application, there is a very high probability that this is the kind of application architecture that you have. Um, it's the most organic, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's natural that this happens without, without some prior planning. So anything can depend on anything else. You also have a layered approach where you can define clear separation. You can say this layer is responsible for this, this one for that, and the communication needs to go in a single direction. You also have a modular approach I hate to break it to you that just because you create a new module doesn't mean it's modular. Um, in this sense, what I mean is something more like monorepo or micro front ends, where you really have a clearly defined small API surface and the rest is truly encapsulated. Um, I'm not going to talk about modular. I think that's a whole another talk. Um, but I'm going to focus on the first two because these are most relevant for applications um, for the vast majority of people in this room. So what's the big difference? Actually, why should I even care what, how my dependencies are organized inside my app? Don't I want to just share everything? Well, think about what happens when something changes. When you're in a big ball of mud, what's the scope of the potential regression of this change? It's everywhere, right? Because you don't know. You don't have any rules in place. You can make some assumptions. You can make some promises to your QA engineer, but there's a very good chance you are wrong, right? So the fact of the matter is you have an unknown scope of regression, and in a bigger team or a team where multiple people are working in different parts of the app, you are very likely to have cross-team conflicts because nobody likes it when someone else has a ticket that appears in their backlog because another team made a change that happened to affect them. Now, what about in a more layered approach? Well, we know that there is a limited potential scope of regression. And at the same time, we also hopefully organize the application architecture in a way that mirrors the way that our team are, teams are structured. So we shouldn't be having these kind of cross-team conflicts. So the key difference between having this big ball of mud and having a well-organized but still monolithic application is how your dependencies are allowed to depend on each other or what restrictions you put in place. 
Let's look at a more specific example that's kind of more concrete for the front end. So imagine you have an application that looks something like this, right? You have your router that is taking care of routing in your app. You have maybe your separate API or data layer where everything coming from your API is, is living there. And you have your UI and you have your, your business logic separated in some way. Now, the important thing is that these two parts of your application, these different pages, should be able to more or less operate on their own. They should not ne necessarily need to know about the rest of the application. They should certainly not know about the other pages that exist, because this means that you have a dependency between them, and this is something that can cause a lot of problems if you introduce a change in one place, and it is highly likely or potentially possible to have a side effect somewhere else. So for each of these pages, the rest of the application may as well not exist. And this is not necessarily the easiest thing to do because it means putting in a lot of restrictions on the way you're writing new code. But at the end of the day, it means your application is more resilient because it's easier to isolate the impact of changes. And dealing with changes is the entire concept of resilience. Now, you might be looking at this and thinking, but Monica, what about shared components? Where are those? Because as developers, we love to make shared code, right? It makes us feel good. It makes us feel moral, you know? Like when I write my shared code and someone else uses it, I feel like I've done a service to them, like something humanitarian. Um, and I get to go home feeling like, you know, increased my karma today because I put a component in the shared folder. Um, but I'm kind of anti uh, shared components when it comes to uh, doing them on the application level. So I really believe that a shared component either belongs in your design system, if you can do it in a way where you can extract out the business logic and make it purely representational, or you should probably consider copying and pasting that code. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the, next, in the next constraint, which is being more conservative about code reuse. Now, as developers, we love making things dry, right? You see a potential abstraction, and you think to yourself, ooh, this is going to be good. Like, I can reduce the number of lines of code overall, right? I can make something that looks beautiful. Uh, depending on what blog post I just read, maybe it's going to look different every time, but it's going to look really nice based on today's standards. But at the end of the day, it often happens that we end up tying together code that is potentially unrelated or shouldn't even know about the other code that depends on that shared code. So you end up with code that is brittle and code that ends up introducing side effects. Now, let's think through a specific example. Imagine you're building a new page in the app that you're working in. It needs a component. And this component looks suspiciously similar to a component that lives somewhere else in the app. And you think, I can generalize that component. So you're like, this is going to be good, right? They're going to be grateful to me. Like, they're going to give me so many thumbs up on my PR, I'm going to get a promotion. Um, so you're like, great. So I take that code, I put it in the shared folder, I generalized it, and then I introduced it in those two pages. Amazing, right? It's going to get merged, claps all around. But what happens over time? What happens with the shared code in your application as you have more and more feature requests? more and more requirements. I often find that these kind of components tend to want to diverge from one another. They want to make a mitosis, like a cell that wants to split. And you start to notice particular signals in these components when they exhibit this behavior. So you start to introduce if statements, like the component has an existential crisis. Where am I and what should I do with myself? You know, it's like, if I'm on this page, I got to do this. If I'm on this other page, I got to do that. You know, um, and you can see this kind of branching. It needs to understand what context am I living in in order to, to have the proper behavior. And what's interesting about this is that you slowly go from having a general component to having a component that only works in two places. And those two places are very tightly coupled together. So the point I want to make here is that decoupled is so much more important than code being dry. And the reason for that is that having dry code is not a, a goal in and of itself, right? 
the goal of having dry code is that you reduce bugs by having less code. But in reality, when you couple together code that ought not to know about each other, you are also introducing a potential source of bugs. So you have to remember, why am I trying to make this code dry in the first place? I thought there was a very nice tweet that illustrated uh, the point that I'm trying to make. It says, a regular person sees either a glass half full or half empty, but an engineer sees them both and learns in what context it makes sense to see it half full and in what context to see it half empty. And the takeaway is that sometimes you just need two glasses, right? Because two people need to be able to drink their water at the same time without you know, one person drops their glass and the other person absolutely has to do the same at that very moment. It's completely impractical. And the result of being more conservative about your code reuse is that you can avoid coupling together code that will most likely diverge over time as you have more and new requirements. The very last thing I want to talk about is enforcing your boundaries. So I'm going to guess that most of you have been there. You have an architecture meeting in your team. You all get together and you say, guys, I think it's time we had some architecture. And you come together and you're like, let's make some documents. Cool. So you like open up Confluence. Maybe you, you make a, a chart or something. Um, you make a bunch of decisions. You document them because you're supposed to document decisions. Um, and then it goes and it lives into this, this Confluence space forever. Last red date, never. Uh, it slowly starts to collect dust. And the reality is, anytime a new developer or just any developer starts to make a new feature, I can guarantee you they will not consult the architecture diagram first. So what's the point then? Why should we even have architecture at all if all of our systems just tend towards entropy and we have to rewrite them at some point? Why, why should we even try? Well, let's look at a specific example here. So imagine you had this app. You saw that it had all these cross dependencies absolutely everywhere, and you went through and you cleaned them up. You found some things that maybe could be shared but shouldn't be, so you made a tiny bit of duplication there in your business logic, and it specialized over time because of the context that it lives in. Now, what happens when a developer comes into this code base and they see those two very similarly sized circles. They see it and they think, I can do something good for the good of mankind, right? Um, you know, they're like, great, it's not in my ticket, but my goodness, I'm going to make it happen. Um, and, and the question is, how do we stop them? <laughs> so I think the answer to this is, we have to do it through automation. Um, there is a really cool concept um, that I learned about within the past like six or 12 months called forbidden dependency tests. And the main concept here is that instead of just writing tests that assert the behavior of your application, you can write tests that assert also the structure of your application. So for example, let's say I have one page in my app and I want to ensure that nobody can ever depend on my code. I can write a rule for that that is going to be asserted in the CI. So I know it's not even possible for somebody to depend on something they shouldn't do. And I can tell you that until you have this, you have no idea what is really happening in your application, even if you had some nice diagrams. No one is using them, I promise. So in the world of JavaScript, there is so far, only one library I have found that does this. It's much more uh, popular in other communities. For example, in Java, they have uh, a well-known tool for this called JDepend. Um, but this one called Dependency Cruiser, uh, it's something, it works. We're using it. I, I mean, it's not like, a, like hugely used by a lot of people. You can write it also yourself, right, you, if you want to do so. Um, but what's very awesome is you can, you can make these kind of assertions about the structure of your app. Uh, it also allows you to do some kind of assertions about circular dependencies. You can write custom rules, etc. So if you're working in a team and you want to assert certain things about the structure of your application are not going to change, definitely check out this library. So the cool thing about this is that you have actually an automated way to preserve your architecture over time. Because as we all know, 
applications tend towards entropy, just like everything else in the universe, right? And we need to find some kind of automated way to begin checking core properties of our applications to make sure they're still healthy. And this is one way to do that when it comes to the structure of the internal dependencies in your app. So I just want to recap quickly, what have we learned today? The first thing we learned is that, unfortunately, the real cost of software is maintenance over time, rather than initially uh, introducing that new feature. We've also learned that architecture doesn't have to be some kind of elitist word that only people who don't code anymore get to think about. Instead, it's about applying smart constraints to your applications so that you can do less and build apps that are able to last longer. And finally, there are some really small changes that you can make in the way that you're building apps that are going to make them more resilient. You can think directionally about your internal dependencies instead of allowing anything to depend on anything else. You can also be more conservative about the code that you decide to reuse and think to yourself a few steps ahead. Is this going to change? What kind of features are going to be added? And finally, we can enforce our boundaries in an automated way so that we don't have to wait until the pull request and some kind of an argument in order to, to actually build code that's conformant to the architecture we dream about. I want to leave you guys with just two last takeaways, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn. Now, a lot of times when people think about architecture, they tend to think about really big stuff, right? You think about Flex or Redux, or you think about frameworks and metaprogramming. And this stuff is great, but at the same time, architecture also begins on the small, because every time you create a new feature, you're making architecture decisions. So whether you create a new function or you decide not to, this is also an architectural decision that is going to affect the maintainability of your code. And finally, I want to just encourage you guys that you don't have to learn architecture from first principles. It is so common for people to run into a problem in their app, an architecture problem, and then think to themselves, what is the React solution to my architecture problem? But oftentimes, the answer has nothing to do with React. It's just pure software architecture. And a lot of times, I think there are books, literature, there are, are talks by people who are in other communities writing other programming languages, and we tend not to really look at those. We tend to say, well, the examples are in Java. You know, it's OOP. Like, you know, you tend to look at this and think, ah, it's not really relevant for me. We've moved on past that. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are communities of around programming languages and programming paradigms that have been building large-scale apps for way longer than we have on the front end. So I just want to encourage you to be open-minded and look at these resources too, because there is a lot that they can still teach us. Thank you very much. And uh, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs>